the Crimson Tide of Alabama clinched their second straight national championship with a convincing 24-9 victory over Arkansas in the Sugar Bowl. Again in 79, it was a stalwart defense led by E.J. Jr. that made the difference. That, together with a devastating offense led by Major Ogilvy, gave the Tide a perfect 12-0 season record. In fact, Alabama was the only team to come away from the regular season and the bowls with a perfect mark. Although the national championship went to Alabama, the Coach of the Year honors were won by Earl Bruce of Ohio State. In his first year as head coach of his alma mater, the team went through the season undefeated and then lost to USC in that Rose Bowl thriller, 17-16. The nation's premier quarterback of 1979 was Mark Wilson of BYU. It was really amazing that he even played during the season, let alone make All-America. Three weeks before the start of the schedule, he was stricken with a ruptured appendix. He began the season 25 pounds under his normal playing weight, and yet he managed to lead his team to an upset win over Texas A&M in the first game. That was an indication of what was to come. He led the nation in total offense, and he was responsible for 32 touchdowns. In his final game against San Diego State for the WAC championship, he connected for four touchdowns in his first five passes. Mark Wilson was drafted by the Oakland Raiders, and going into the 80s, he was learning the ropes behind Jim Plunkett. He plans a law career after he tries pro ball. He's called the incredible Hugh Green, unanimous All-America selection as a junior. Hugh Green, defensive end, tackle, and linebacker of the Pitt Panthers. Hugh Green is about as destructive a one-man machine as college football has ever seen. His number 99 seems to be everywhere on the field. Going into his final season, he already had made 350 tackles and had 33 quarterback sacks for more than 200 lost yards. At 6'2 and 220 pounds, Green is rock hard. He hits with a finality that has drawn the awe of opposing players. His very presence has caused teams to run away from his position, thereby weakening their attack. Observers are certain of one prediction, that Hugh Green will be a first-round draft choice by some very lucky NFL team. Vegas Ferguson of Notre Dame came from Richmond, Indiana, from a family of 10 children who were raised by their grandparents. He became the greatest runner in the history of Notre Dame football, surpassing the marks established by the immortal George Gipp, and in later years, Jerome Heavens. His versatility in running made him the great that he was. He could outrun some, and those that he couldn't, he would fake out. And when he was trapped, he could lower his shoulder and run through a defender. All Vegas Ferguson ever thought about was reaching the end zone. He tried to get there however he could, and his methods were sound because nobody else at Notre Dame ever did it any better than this man. Ferguson should have a long and illustrious career in professional football. His serious approach to the game and lack of any prima donna attitude made him a top choice of the New England Patriots. Ken Marjoram of Stanford climaxed his junior year by being named as a consensus All-America player in 1979 as a wide receiver. He's called the young man with the suction cup hands. Get the ball near him, it just sticks to him like glue. He's the top touchdown receiver in Stanford history. Despite being doubled and triple teamed by opponents, he continues to make catches that are in the spectacular category. Even when he occasionally misses, it isn't because he doesn't try. In 1979, saw a six foot, five inch, 250 pound tight end from Nebraska tabbed as the number one draft choice of the Atlanta Falcons come into his own. Junior Miller was just about as perfect a physical specimen as one could hope for. His coach, Tom Osborne, said that Miller had that uncanny knack of turning short passes into touchdowns. He certainly is the Cornhuskers' top tight end in history with 13 career touchdowns. This was one of his most remarkable games against Penn State. After taking this pass for a touchdown to bring the Huskers to a 14-7 deficit, he got completely behind the defense 
and Tim Hager found it with this 70 yard bomb. This was the touchdown that enabled Nebraska to tie the score at 14 to 14. That took the heart out of Penn State. And the Big Red went on to score a resounding 42 17 victory. Brad Buddy became the first freshman player to start for Southern California since World War II. For four years, he was absolutely brilliant at his offensive guard spot. His father, Ed Buddy, was a former great at Michigan State and later an all pro guard with the Kansas City Chiefs. When Brad was 13, he was lifting weights and working out. He wanted to play football so badly, nothing would deny him the chance. He could block any way that was called on, straight ahead, lead or post, pass block, or simply move ahead to bury an opponent so that backs like Charles White could go flying overhead. To no one's surprise, he was the first round draft choice of Kansas City, where he became a starter in his rookie season. His teammate, Charles White, climaxed his career with the Trojans by winning the Heisman Trophy in 1979. Following in the footsteps of previous Trojan winners, O.J. Simpson and Mike Garrett. When his career was over with the Trojans, he had moved into the number two spot in all time rushing behind Tony Dorsett. In Charles White's senior year, he led the nation in rushing, and he became the top runner in the history of the Pac-10, and that's a conference famous for producing outstanding running backs. His coach, John Robinson, called him the toughest player he'd ever seen. He was at his best in the fourth quarter when most people were beginning to get tired. And it was in the fourth quarter against UCLA in his senior year on this play that Charles White broke the conference rushing record and it was acknowledged on the Coliseum scoreboard. Charles White was taken as a first round draft pick by Cleveland. But no matter what happens to him in pro ball, his days at USC will never be forgotten by his many admirers. He had the distinction of being the best in college football in 1979. In the 70s, there was one man who stood atop all in the coaching profession. Paul Bear Bryant of Alabama. He became the only coach in the history of the game to win more than 100 victories during the period of one decade. In the 70s, his Crimson Tide won 103. Under the watchful eyes of Coach Bryant, who stands atop his famous tower in Tuscaloosa, the Alabama players go through the rigors of practice. It's the hard work here that enabled them to win eight SEC titles and two national championships in the 70s. At the close of the decade, before the start of the 80 season, we visited Tuscaloosa and asked Bear about his health. Oh, I feel great, Bill. Uh, I spent some time out there resting, losing some weight. Uh, uh, to be honest about it, I, <laughs> I gave my heart too much to do. And thankfully, there wasn't anything wrong with my heart. It's just what I gave it to do, according to the doctor, that it wasn't quite strong enough to do the things I was asked to do. So after losing some weight and taking on a special diet and so forth. I feel great, maybe around for 100 years, you can't tell. During the 80s, Paul Bear Bryant could become the winningest coach in the history of college football, which may very well qualify him for being coach of the century. The game of the decade took place on November the 25th, 1971. It was a cold and overcast day in Norman, Oklahoma at Owen Field. There couldn't have been a more dramatic setting as the visiting Cornhuskers, coached by Bob Devaney, ranked number one of the nation, squared off against the number two team, Oklahoma, coached by Chuck Fairbanks, the nation's leading offensive and scoring machine. No less than nine All-America players were on the field this day. 63,000 fans were there to watch the classic. The vaunted Nebraska defense was awesome. Repeatedly, All-America guard Rich Glover, number 79, broke in to destroy the Oklahoma wishbone attack before it could get started. When Glover wasn't messing up the Sooners, defensive end Willie Harper, number 81, added his huge frame to the mayhem. Defensive pressure forced the Sooners to punt early. And who will ever forget this punt return by Johnny Rogers of Nebraska. His start-stop, double-clutching style of running was never more apparent or more effective than it was on this 72-yard return for a Nebraska touchdown.
With just three minutes and 32 seconds gone in the game, Nebraska was off to a 7-0 lead. The Sooners narrowed that to 7-3 with a 30-yard field goal by John Carroll in the first quarter. But in the second period, the Huskers were on the move again. Fullback Jeff Kinney powers his way into the end zone from the one-yard line, and the score goes to 14-3 Nebraska, with the Big Red fans waving their number one signs with very good reason. But in the closing minutes of that first half, Oklahoma mounted a sustained drive that carried them down to the two-yard line. From there, Jack Mildred, working the option to perfection, carries the ball into the end zone, climaxing a brilliant 80-yard march. With five minutes and 10 seconds to go in the first half, it's Nebraska 14, Oklahoma 10. With a little less than one minute to play, the Sooners have the ball of their own 33. Meldrin fires a perfect pass to John Harrison for 43 yards and a first down at the 24. And then, with just five seconds remaining on the clock, Meldrin has time for one play. He goes to his favorite receiver, looking for Harrison. He lofts the ball to him, and Harrison makes a great catch for the go-ahead touchdown. Halftime score, Oklahoma 17, Nebraska 14. The game was indeed living up to everything that had been predicted about it. The Cornhuskers came out of the third quarter, determined to control the football. Taking advantage of an OU fumble, Jerry Taggy moved the team down the field with a masterful set of calls. He himself played a great part in that drive with his beautifully executed fake and a run of 39 yards down to the Sooner three, first and goal to go. And on the very next play, Jeff Kinney spins into the end zone, and the Cornhuskers are back on top, 21 to 17. Eight minutes to go in the third quarter. It wasn't long until they were threatening again. Taggy passes to Rogers, who squirms and maneuvers for every possible yard. 20 in all, and eventually is tossed out of bounds in the Oklahoma 16. One more pass to Rogers, moves to the one, and from there, the Sooners couldn't keep Kinney out of the end zone, as Nebraska scores 14 unanswered points in the third quarter to take the lead, 28-17. Oklahoma continued to rally under the strong leadership of Mildred. For the fourth straight time in this drive, he carried the ball himself, and this time, it's an Oklahoma touchdown. The Husker lead now narrowed to 28-24, 28 seconds to go in the third quarter. And then early in the fourth quarter came the break the Sooners had been hoping for. Taggy is hit hard by Danny Mullen. He fumbles the ball, and Lucius Selman comes up with it for Oklahoma. 11 minutes and 47 seconds to play. After calling 10 out of 11 plays on the ground, Mildred crossed up the defense, which was expecting another run on fourth and five. Instead, he sailed a soft pass to Harrison for the Oklahoma touchdown. The Huskers were in a spot, trailing 31-28 with less than seven minutes to play. The strategy was discussed by Coach Devaney and quarterback Taggy. The most reliable runner in Nebraska history, Jeff Kinney, was called on. He delivered with this 17-yard run, breaking three tackles, getting the ball into Oklahoma territory to the 48. And then the key play in this drive, maybe in the ball game. Third down and eight at the OU 46. Taggy scrambles, looks for Rodgers. Johnny makes a falling down catch, good for 11 yards and a first down. The drive is alive. Just a little over four minutes to go now, with the pressure mounting to unbelievable proportions. With the Sooners concentrating on stopping Kinney, Taggy slips the ball to Rodgers inside, and Johnny picks up seven to the Oklahoma 15. Then after Kinney moved it to the eight, came a play they still talk about to this day. Kinney is hit. When he falls to the ground, the ball bounces loose. The officials ruled the play was dead, that Kinney was on the ground when the ball was fumbled. And even though Lucius Selman came up with it for Oklahoma, he had to give it back. It was still Nebraska's ball on the six, second down. And then with just one minute and 38 seconds to play, Jeff Kinney cracked into the end zone for his fourth touchdown of the game. The Cornhusker fans went wild as the bright lights of the scoreboard blink. Nebraska 35, Oklahoma 31. Seldom have two teams had as many emotional highs and lows in one game as they had in this one. Everyone came away drawn and limp, just like the players and the coaches from the game of the decade. Well, that's it. A look backwards to the golden decade of college football in the 70s. It sure does bring back lots of memories, doesn't it? This is Bill Fleming thanking you very much for adding this tape to your sports library. I should like to tell you, however, that there is one play that you haven't seen yet that we thought 
was the most inventive play that we saw all during that decade. Watch, and I think you'll agree. Shakespeare might have written it, exeunt all with the ball. <laughs>